Dina. I'm Sakshi. Um, I'm a Technovation alum. I joined Technovation about three years back um, as a mentor. Um, mm-hmm. I used to mentor girls in uh, into the entire curriculum. So you know, developing apps and uh, business models and launching them. And uh, then I later started my own venture, Palm Theory, which is a B two B agri tech startup tackling ugly produce. And uh, yeah, I'm really glad to be interviewing you today on behalf of Technovation. Mm-hmm. Could you just um, briefly, um, you know, uh, introduce yourself, your title, your responsibilities? Sure. Um, so my name is Dina Shacker. I'm a partner at Lux Capital, um, which is an early stage um, venture capital firm with about $2.5 billion under management. Um, and we invest in um, everything from seed through growth, but Series A is really our sweet spot. Um, and uh, generally speaking, we like to uh, invest in innovators that we say are turning science fiction into fact. How did you get into venture capital? How did I get into venture capital? That is a very good question. So I have a very non-traditional background for somebody in venture. Um, when I graduated college, which was in 2008, so almost 12 years ago, I was convinced that I was gonna do a PhD in anthropology. Pretty much the most non-venture PhD you could possibly get, uh, but that's truly what I thought that I wanted to do. Um, my whole academic career, my early days, even in high school, I was always optimizing for impact. And particularly at the time, my passion um, was for building bridges and sort of changing the narrative around um, with, with the Middle East, um, and particularly Middle East and US relations, which is a function of my personal background. My family comes from Iraq and also just sort of coming of age as an Arab and Muslim American. Um, post 9-11. So I was really committed to that and I thought that academia and anthropology would be the best path to do that. Um, But I ended up pursuing a master's instead, thankfully, which was a two-year commitment, which I was able to get a full scholarship for because I was uh, independently funding both my undergraduate and graduate school. Um, and so I, I ended up in DC. I was doing uh, starting my master's in two th- this you know fall of 2008 at Georgetown in Arab Studies. Um, and because I was always doing a number of side hustles while I was in school to help fund my education, um, I you know I traditionally liked if I could to find myself in an opportunity that was both economically beneficial but importantly also would help me kind of figure out what I wanted to do uh, vocationally. So that first year, um, I spent a year at the Aspen Institute working on nonprofit and social innovation. Um, and, and I also had a little, little brief foray in journalism. So I was on air actually as a journalist um, doing a bilingual news show in Arabic and English. And then I started with the BBC for a summer. So the summer between my first and second year of grad school, I interned with the BBC and I was helping to cover the White House. And Um, President Obama that summer gave a really pivotal speech, um, which became known as the Cairo speech or the New Beginnings speech. And that was about new beginnings with the Muslim world and about many things associated with it. But the the part that sort of really struck me was around technology and education and entrepreneurship as a way of building bridges. I had founded a tech company, um, an e-commerce company um, when I was in college. I grew up in Silicon Valley. Um, I always had product instincts and sort of a like a little bit of a tech geek in me, but I didn't see that as a career path given I had these sort of impact and global aspirations. And at the time, I didn't necessarily see how those two would merge. So um, I joined the Obama administration. After, after covering that speech, I realized I didn't want to be writing about these moments in history. I wanted to be a part of them. And that this would probably be the only moment in my life where I would be so motivated and moved by a particular president um, to join. So abandoned my nascent career in journalism, joined the Obama administration specifically to work on all the policy that came out of that speech. So I helped plan the first Global Entrepreneurship Summit. I got involved in Partners for a New Beginning. I helped plan the diaspora um, entrepreneurship programs and eventually spearheaded that and spun it out into a a nonprofit. Um, And I found myself spending more and more time in Silicon Valley as part of those efforts. In doing so, there was something else that happened at that time, sort of outside of my personal world, and that was the Arab Spring. So we're now talking, you know, 2011. Um, I witnessed what technology did to catalyze a grassroots movement in a way that I didn't think was possible just a few years before that. 
Um, and I was already beginning to spend time on the ground in Silicon Valley and feel the energy and, and be just refreshed by the, the notion of building product and, and what that could do to the social fabric that we're living in. This was sort of the beginning of what I think now is called the, the fourth industrial revolution. So that's what impelled me to get into tech. Um, I joined Google um, specifically on their social impact team, which used to be called google.org. Um, that is not the same google.org as today, which is more fo for focused on um, philanthropy. At the time, it was product for social impact, which is what I wanted to do. I wanted to work on product. So I spent a few years working on building out our civic technology tools, and then the next five years working on early stage product across Google. My team was generally the first you know, BD or business person that would come in um, whenever a, a technical team had a product concept or product idea that they wanted to um, commercialize or work with external partners on. It was super fun. So our team worked on everything from Waymo when it was just you know, a, a stealth project within Google to Loon to um, Verily when it was still within Google X, uh, Fiverr and a number of other early stage products. That was super fun. Um, I stumbled upon healthcare and helped uh, really build one of Google's first HIPAA compliant products, which was a telemedicine play as part of the Help Outs um, product. Um, and started to realize through doing all of that, how much innovation was actually happening outside of big tech and how much more impactful some of these really early stage companies with very little funding and resources were than some of these massively well-resourced products and projects within Google. Um, so that was another moment for me where I realized, uh, you know, as much as I loved and learned so much from my experience at Google, I really wanted to go to the earlier stage. So explored a number of avenues, um, potentially joining an early stage company, um, toyed around with starting one, um, and eventually landed on venture. So ended up at GV, the artist formerly known as Google Ventures. Um, I had a wonderful experience there for a couple of years, um, and then ended up at uh, here I am at Lux Capital, where I joined about eight months ago. I first got to know Technovation when I was in my very first role at Google. So this was in like, you know, 2012, 2013. Um, maybe it was 2014 by the time I first connected with Tara, but I was uh, helping to lead our efforts around promoting um, and, and supporting diversity in computer science and, um, and also in entrepreneurship. And so we met with a number of different companies and I was absolutely moved by what Tara was building um, and helped support um, their, uh, that organization through Google. So I've been part of the journey since then. So it's not something easily summarized, but hopefully that gives you a good background. And um, you've had a long journey. Uh you know, Howard, Google, Lux, uh, in the middle of your own venture, who's been the backbone to support you? And it, it must be hard, especially being a Muslim immigrant, um, you know, before Silicon Valley was Silicon Valley. And um, how do you go about it? What are the different challenges you faced? And who was there always by your side to sort of help you out? Yes, well, I consider myself very lucky. My parents are the ones who did the hard work of, of immigrating um, and starting a new life here in Silicon Valley when they left Iraq. Um, so I was really born into, um, you know, a, a, what I think was really a position of privilege. And that was something that really guided a lot of my motivation. Um, in fact, I wrote my college admissions essay about this very topic um, in, in, you know, 2000, I probably written, wrote it in 2003, that I, you know, this is, just a few years after 9-11 um, and the war on Iraq, which is where I'm from, and just sort of knowing how, uh, you know, a, a simple stroke of luck uh, landed me being born in, you know, Mountain View, California, as opposed to Baghdad, Iraq, and having had to um, undergo, you know, years of uh, sanctions and war and more war, and there's, you know, the situation here we are now, years later, is, is not much better. So that um, knowledge of my luck and how serendipitous that was really just gave me, um, motivated me to to have um, a passion for, for impact and, and a work ethic. In terms of who's been there for me all along, I mean, certainly when I was younger, my, my parents were my um, you know, were my rocks. I have three brothers as well, one of which continues to, um, having been motivated by the same sort of um, factors, continues to give back in his own way. He's a human rights lawyer and is um, the head of Human Rights Watch for, um, for Israel-Palestine. So that's kind of 
although we went to the same graduate program in Washington, D.C., we could not have landed in two more sort of different places in terms of our day-to-day -day jobs, but we're <laughs> fundamentally motivated by similar um, similar things. Um, so my, my siblings have been great, and in the last almost nine years since I've been married, there's nobody who's who has enabled me to do to do what I do more than my husband, who's my um, partner and best friend and like makes all of this possible, especially given we have two kids who are still pretty little. Wow. Um, Dina, are there any projects that you've been, uh, you, you know, proud of or personally involved in? Yeah, well, I'm very proud of, of being a supporter and a board on the board of Technovation. So that's definitely one of them. Um, I've also been involved um, in a number of nonprofits over the years, um, including one called Tech Wadi, um, which is sort of the leading nonprofit that's helping to build bridges between the U.S. and the Middle East um, and the Arab world in particular via um, uh, entrepreneurship. Um, so strong network here in Silicon Valley. We bring a lot of companies from the region and help them with their fundraising and business development efforts and just help to build connectivity in the diaspora. Um, I'm on the board of an organization called Amadis, which is one of the leading educational nonprofits in the region. Um, and spent, I'm also a term member of the Council of Foreign Relations um, and very much still plugged into the policy world from that perspective. Um, and then I do a lot of really just one-on-one -on -one personal um, mentoring and coaching um and and that's one way that at least personally i feel like i'm i'm giving back um, because i can tell you i've been involved in some of the largest most global efforts around impact literally like at the you know at the executive level and in, in the obama administration but sometimes the most impactful work that i've done has just been via a one-on-one -on -one relationship and helping to um helping an individual in a way that I wish I had been helped or in, in some cases how I have been um, throughout the years. Wow. How do you uh, give advice on uh, pitching a social enterprise to the audience, to investors, uh, onboarding your team members? How do you craft that pitch? Um, so in general, crafting a pitch is, um, you know, there's advice that can be given. I actually was on a panel about called perfecting your pitch recently at Fortune's Most Powerful Women Conference. So I talk, spent an hour talking about this in particular. Um, but I don't think that the general advice I would give about giving a pitch would be any different for a social enter enterprise versus, um, you know, any other type of enterprise. So there's sort of general advice, which, you know, I could spend an hour talking about in terms of, you um, everything from initial email to the actual deck itself to the um, interactions with the investors and best practices around that. For a social enterprise in particular, to answer your question, I think it's really going to depend on who the pitch is, is, is motivated towards, really doing your homework on the investor. Um, if we're talking about fundraising in particular, if it, if it is a fund like Lux, which is not an impact fund, but really is uh, focused on investing in, um, you know, in successful companies that will, that will um, you know, be standalone um, businesses, then that's what, what you really focus on. If you're um, speaking to an entity that is um, an impact investor, or perhaps even a non, you know, a foundation, um, or an endowment, etc., or a family office, then you're going to focus on different metrics. Okay, well, that was really fun. Thank you. And I look forward to seeing um, this and all the other interviews that you all do.